All right, I think it's one o'clock, so we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second series of our uh, refugee employment. Uh, we couldn't have done this without Refugee Alliance of Central Iowa. So thank you, Stephanie, and everyone that's been involved with that. Um, I know people will still be coming in as we are beginning. So um, if you can, and your name does not match who you are with um, with who you are in the room, if you could hover over your uh, your name and change that, that would just kind of help us with attendance. Um, we've had some glitches with Zoom, so um, if you could do that, that would really be appreciated. Um, so just for today's um, introductions, I am Drew Emerson with Iowa Works. I'm a business marketing specialist here in the Des Moines office, and uh, I have Nicole on the email as well, or not the email, the Zoom account as well, um, and she will be um, navigating all the questions to us at the end. We so if you do have questions, just put them in the chat box, um, and we'll try to field those at the end. Um, and then at the very end, we also have some time reserved if you want to stick around for the end portion. So, um, without that, uh, we also have uh, Aaron uh, from the CFI portion or Title One, and we have Edgar with our refugee services. So, and I will hand that off to them. So, um, Aaron and Edgar, take it away. Okay, uh, can, can everybody hear me? All right, so, well, let's get started. Uh, this is, my name is Edgar Ramirez. I'm with the Bureau of Refugee Services, and we're gonna have uh, questions that were selected to, uh, we provided to the, to the employers to answer. So uh, we're gonna be going over those questions. And then towards, towards the end, we'll have possibly time to answer those questions that are coming through the chat. And I'm Aaron Webb, and I am with uh, Connect to Careers, and just really excited to be here and help employers um, get some insight into what it could look like to successfully employ um, refugees. And we have a wonderful group of panelists that we would love to introduce and have you learn about them. So first panelist is Allison from Donabella Shreds. Allison, do you want to say something? Yes, I do. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, we're probably going to do introductions later for a company, but um, unless you'd like me to do that now. Yeah, you can uh, go ahead now. Okay, so uh, so I'm Allison. I'm the owner and founder of Donabella Shreds. And what we do is we upcycle uh, new unused textile remnants and create um, eco-friendly fashion accessories. So technically, we are a wholesale manufacturer and we distribute um, to about a thousand retailers nationwide. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, next we have Alex uh, Borsé from Michael Foods. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, so I am a senior recruiter with Michael Foods. Uh, if you're not familiar with Michael Foods, that's okay. We're one of the largest companies you've uh, probably never heard of. Uh, so we make a variety of different egg products and potato products and also different meat products, uh, basically centered around um, uh, breakfast. So um, I'm based out of our facility here in Norwalk, uh, just south of Des Moines, and uh, really excited to be here today. Thank you. And we also have Jackie from Mercy One. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Easy McGee, and um, um, you may be familiar with Mercy One, but I'd like to uh, make you aware of our mission as it relates to the multifaceted issues that women, people of color, persons with disabilities, LBGTQ+, religious uh, minorities, and other marginalized groups face, we feel it's our responsibility to understand and address, and that everyone has an equal opportunity and deserves access to health care to live their best lives. So to do so, we really believe and promote cultural humility, which means that we want, as part of the cultural humility journey, we want to reflect the workforce. We want our workforce to reflect the communities in which we serve across Iowa, and that would include about 20,000 employees. So I'm happy to be here today to share that mission and how we accomplish it. 
Thank you, Jackie. And then uh, uh, fine. lastly, we have Dana Larson from the Storm Lake community. Hi, I'm Dana. I'm the communications coordinator for the city of Storm Lake. And I have been a newspaper editor here previously for about 30 years. So I've seen a lot of uh, groups come and add to our community. We're working hard on assimilation and equity in Storm Lake. And it's probably per capita Storm Lake's um, most diverse community or Iowa's most diverse community, I would say. So we'd be happy to address anything that we can. And thanks very much for having us. Great, thank you. Thank you all uh, to our panel, uh, to our panelists and for everybody in the audience, uh, everybody participating here today. Uh, th th the main focus to, to have this webinar is to find uh, collaboration opportunities between employers, different organizations, Iowa Works, Title I, et cetera. Um, the, the main focus is to enhance life enrichment opportunities to job seekers. In this case, specifically, we're talking about foreign-born Iowans, refugees. And in the mean, in, it, it, while trying to remove the uh, barriers to employment. So hopefully this is very helpful and uh, let's get started. Okay, so question number one. Uh, this question is for Alex with Michael Foods and Alice um, with Donabella. How have you modified your hiring standards for refugees or foreign born Iowans, such as application and interview process? How has that been successful? In what ways have you accommodated new hire training? And when were the challenges and what went well? Um, Alex, do you wanna start? Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for, for that question. Um, so when we're, we're looking at uh, foreign born um, Iowans and refugees, obviously the, the elephant in the room that needs to be addressed is, you know, the, the language barrier and how we get past that. So, um, so here we're very fortunate that we have a very diverse group of uh, employees here. Uh, we worked very hard at identifying those individuals when we first opened up back in 2019 uh, that are bilingual and really make sure that we are in, able to integrate them into um, our, our facilities and really make sure that we're able to uh, retain them uh, in their talents. So uh, we're able to use those interpreters to help with the interview process. So whenever we have someone come in and fill out an application, um, you know, we're able to offer assistance to them. Uh, we don't want someone to feel like because our applications are online that, you know, it's just on them for them to complete at home. And then, um, you know, maybe they get it filled out, maybe they don't. You know, we do everything that we can to try to help them fill out that application. And that includes using interpreters when needed to make sure that they're able to fill everything out correctly and that they understand everything. Um, also on top of that, when it comes to the interview process, uh, we have uh, translators there that help uh, interpret and then give them a tour and make sure that um, they see everything and have someone explain that to them, um, you know, so that they are able to understand uh, exactly what the, what the job is. Uh, along the way on the tour, we make sure that they are able to connect with those individuals that they may be able to communicate with out there so that they really understand um, you know, they're, they're not going to be alone out there. There's plenty of people that, uh, you know, are their same group uh, that are out there and they'll be able to befriend and work along with and communicate with. Uh, along with that, when it comes time for training, obviously you can't uh, train someone uh, very effectively if you're not able to communicate effectively with them, right? So uh, again, we have uh, that communication uh, via translators. Uh, we do also have some different forms translated into different languages uh, so that they're able to access that. Um, it's been something that we've seen a lot of success with is using translators to uh, help bring in new people and help get that interview process squared away with, uh, with the translator's help. So um, it was a challenge at first, make sure that we were able to, you know, accommodate all the different languages and all the different uh, diversity groups in uh, the area. Um, but again, you know, we worked really hard to make sure that we were able to bring those individuals in who were bilingual and utilize them uh, to the best of our ability to try to help, uh, help create an environment that's warm and welcoming to those individuals. 
Good. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Alison. Hi. Yes. So um, we're very small business. And when I started the company, it was just myself and my husband. And uh, we kind of grew very quickly and looked at the opportunity to hire or to, to, to interview some refugees. And I think um, at the beginning, I, I got very, very luck, lucky. And my first hire was Pa um, from Burma or Myanmar. And um, we did have a translator right from the beginning and she stepped up to the plate, very minimal English. Um, so I think as far as, you know, we do, we manufacture, we do a lot of handmade. She's a seamstress from Burma. Um, so it was a lot of hands-on uh, training, but also we kind of got down to different apps um, as far as going, okay, what do you, let's, let's, what, you know, what do you mean from here? So it was very, you know, it was, it, it was a little difficult right at the beginning. Um, she was very interested in learning English. So she took some classes and um, I think right from, from there, she, when we started to grow, she knew people from her community. So she would go, oh no, I have my sister-in-law. I have my other sister-in-law. I have, you know, so she started to bring on other people and she essentially did the hiring. <laughs> so um, again, it was, it was very, and she's still with us today. And so now it's been eight years since she's been here and she is our production manager. She is our supervisor. Um, when we don't, you know, she is in charge of the hiring. She is in charge of the firing at this point. So again, it's, we, we lucked out, um, right from the beginning, but again, it was, it was tough to find the right person, um, right from the beginning. Uh, we're, right now we have a team. It's only Burmese women that we have hired just because the community, um, it, they, they, um, you know, they're, they're a community on, on their own, like, you know, as far as production goes. So, um, so yeah, I'm all over the place, but that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. I'd like to Wonderful. feedback off that if, if I may, Allison, I love the fact that you say that you took Pa and, you know, started her from the, the bottom and promoted her all the way up to being a manager. And I think for any organization to see success with a refugee program, that empowerment of our employees and that empowerment of our team um, and really developing them is going to be it's going to be key, right? We want to make sure that not only are we bringing people in, but these people have a means to communicate with the upper management. And it sounds like you've created that in PAW. And it's important that they, you know, feel comfortable going to their, their supervisor or their manager. And I, I think that's awesome that, you know, you have uh, promoted her up to a manager. And I think, again, you know, for any organization that's trying to create that uh, refugee or immigrant uh, foreign born Iowa program, that development of your team has to be an integral part of your, your plan. It can't be just bring the people in and then just see where they go from there. No, you have to have a clear plan of how can you get these people in, but also how can we develop them? How can we make these people grow within our company and in turn help our company grow because of, of their, their efforts? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for adding that, Alex, and thanks for both of your answers. Um, I do want to just say, say really quick, um, I just want to encourage people who are on the call to um, submit their questions into the chat, because I'm sure that you probably have a couple of follow-up questions from what you've heard so far. I know I do, so um, go ahead and submit those in the chat, and we will go over those um, once we've gone through all of our questions. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Edgar. No, you're fine. You know, so something to take away from this question. Thank you, Alex and Allison. But um, I, I, one of the things that I took away from here, uh, aside from acknowledging the elephant in the room, right, that's a challenge. And then the question is, what do I do with this elephant? Right. And I think two words come to mind, flexibility like Alex was saying, being flexible, bending, uh, not the rules, but being flexible on the application process, the interview process, having those uh, uh, interpreters that are available. How, how, what can I do for you and I to communicate and obtain the goal, right? Make, make the elephant smaller, less heavy, and eventually go away, or at least not 
be a nuisance, right? It, it, it is a constant reminder what, what we're dealing. And then uh, Alison, you brought uh, opportunity, right? Be, being able to believe in that person, uh, provide the opportunity, uh, pro providing ways to move up uh, on the ladder, promoting, right? E English classes, uh, supporting, and then b b both of you uh, and, and they nail it, right? Um, they're going to be your best recruiters, right? I have a friend that has a friend that has a cousin and eventually you have people knocking at your door. So thank you. Thank you very much for this insight. Okay, so going on to question two. Question two is, have you made allowances for employees to attend ELL or English language learning classes? If so, what were the results? And I believe Jackie is going to start us off with this one. Thank you, Erin. And um, I do want to also reiterate what Edgar was just saying about how important it is to address upfront, um, you know, any barriers and certainly language um, often becomes that barrier. So now keep in mind, we've had 120 years of experience in, in this area. So we're a little different um, from some of the newer companies. But yes, we have had many iterations of providing opportunities for our colleagues to either attend off-site ELL classes. And, and right now, even though I have a statewide perspective, uh, I'm going to speak only about our campuses here in Des Moines, but because we are so close to Des Moines um, Area Community College and the urban campus, we were early on able to provide ELL classes to our colleagues. Um, and I would say as far as 40 years ago, when our colleagues from Vietnam were resettled in our community and we wanted to make sure that they had the best optimal employee experience. Um, so we've done the off-site campuses, but our classes, excuse me, ELL. But then of course, as demographics changed in not only our Mercy One colleague population um, mirroring the community population where today, as I speak to you today, we probably have requests for language services from both colleagues and patients and families for 70 plus languages. So it started to becoming a little less practical to, you know, just like when we started with just the Vietnamese and Lao maybe class, Thai Dam classes. Um, so then we have provided opportunities for employees who wished on their own to take ELL classes. And again, keep in mind that we're centrally located and we did have, you know, the campuses of Des Moines Area Community College. Um, and um, we also have supported many of our resettlement agencies, um, such as Catholic Charities, who offer classes as they do the onboarding for their families that they serve. So we provide um, financial support um, and those and those all aren't even Mercy employees. We believe that it's important for our entire community to really be engaged in any efforts um, to, you know, uplift and improve families. And this is one way we can contribute by supporting those classes. And so finally, now, just like everyone else, we have moved to the age of technology. And because um, we have use of an internal intranet system, we do have an opportunity for any of our colleagues who wish to take, um, and I don't think that we have as widespread um, number of languages, although we do have some vendors um, that can provide this opportunity and they would have, um, um, more uh, languages, you know, perhaps than Des Moines Area Community College and so forth. So we do have that opportunity now available for our colleagues. And since I am speaking from an Iowa perspective, you know, it does vary per community. What we do here in Central Iowa, um, and we have a gentleman here from Storm Lake, you would understand this, is vastly different than our, than our sites in Centerville, Elkader, Mason City. Um, so that's why technology is very helpful to us in that respect. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, what great insight and feedback. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to add on to that, to what anything that Jackie said? Any panelists? I might add that uh, we've also had requests, Aaron, from some of our colleagues who are English speaking and want to learn how to communicate with their patients. And so they are interested in taking Spanish, um, Burmese, so forth, you know, and so um, it's, it's kind of a two way street. And so it's great that we can um, provide that for, you know, for both of our both ways. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great point. So awesome. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the third question. And Edgar, take it away. All right. Uh, this third question is for Dana and Alex. So question number three, what cultural differences did you experience working with refugee populations? Were you able to implement changes to support cultural differences? So uh, Dana, I'll have you start. I think you're, you're you're muted, Dana. If you're talking, we cannot see you. Sorry. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's from Lake. It's just become kind of natural to us to assimilate people, just because we've been doing it since the 1970s. So uh, most of the people that have grown up here now, whether they're new to the community or they're native people who have been here forever, they kind of know that that's the process. So. Um, Basically, there's differences, of course, with language, um, some differences with dress, there's differences with celebrations, uh, those kind of things, nothing that terribly gets in the way of work. Uh, one example we've got is a uh, Micronesian population here, and to them we found that funerals were very important in their extended periods of time, and at first workforces didn't recognize that you can't have multiple days off for a funeral in most places. And they've learned to accommodate that if they want to keep their employees. So um, that's one example of a cultural differences that we've dealt with. Um, the things that we've implemented to support them, uh, I think, is just respecting what they're bringing. You know, in a way, we need to appreciate them for more than just labor, that they're bringing a lot to the community beyond that. Some of the things we do here, there's a parade of nations that's on the 4th of July. It leads off our, our parade that we have in the town and different groups all have their native costumes and they all have signs and banners and art and things like that and march through. So people can appreciate them and see you know, how vibrant they are and how many things they bring to the community. Um, we have dance groups from different cultures here that perform that people enjoy. Um, our library has some um, different native languages and books that they can use. So. That helps, I think, in the learning process and just showing that we appreciate them and respect them. You know, I think those are, are the basic things that we do. And there's lots of them, but um, basically, if there's one thing you can do to, to get that group started in a proper way, it's to find a key person within that group who's maybe an elder or a trusted, respected uh, person that they're going to turn to and work through that person because they need to, to have a specific place they can go for answers to find out about things that they need to do in the community, what the laws are, you know, what resources are out there for them, health things that they need to know. Um, I think every community has probably gone through under COVID, you know, getting that information out to people who speak different languages and come from different places where health isn't looked at the same way necessarily. So, you know, that's something that was a learning process here anyway, that we've had to get that information to them and find that key person, you know, if that person can stand up and take the shot in front of people, everybody else is going to follow. In sports, we see the same thing. In football, it was hard to field a high school football team because more than half of our population grew up in places where they didn't play football, didn't, you know, had maybe ever seen a football game. But when you find that one junior or senior from that population who's willing to go out and have some success, the younger kids see that and follow. So, you know, it's the same thing with the workplace, finding that one person, you know, who can be successful and who can start to rise up through the layers of, of that workforce. And other people will, will see that opportunity and follow. So 
that's kind of the things that we're working on. Thank, thank you, Dana. All, all of this is very important. Um, uh, uh, Alex? Yeah, so I think um, first off, when we're talking about uh, cultural differences and changes, I think it's uh, important first off to uh, understand what the differences are and how we can be flexible with those. So what we've had success with is if we're bringing in a new um, you know, refugee group, uh, we'll try to identify someone that we can partner with and learn about that specific uh, group. And if there's anything specific um, that they may require some sort of accommodations for. So for example, um, when we first opened, uh, we had uh, a large population of uh, refugees coming in and they were wearing head coverings. And so our policy, we're a food manufacturing facility. Uh, we have a pretty strict uh, dress code out on the floor and employees typically are not allowed to wear hats. Uh, so what we did is we were able to adjust our policies and allow for employees to wear head coverings with proper uh, hair nets and PPEs over top of them. So we're still, you know, doing our due diligence to protect uh, the consumer and make sure that, you know, we're putting out a high, uh, high quality product and we're not, not necessarily changing our policies, but, you know, we're adjusting them to make accommodations for those individuals that may require head coverings. And so, um, again, another example that I can think of is our facility in Chaska. Um, I, I see in the chat, bo uh, chat uh, box here that someone asked about religious accommodations. And our facility in Chaska, Minnesota has a very large uh, Somali population, uh, which the Somali population is largely uh, of the Muslim faith. And so in bringing those individuals on, uh, we needed to make accommodations for these people to have dedicated prayer times so that they're able to go uh, observe their faith. Uh, along with that, they've uh, created a special foot washing station there um, and a special dedicated room for them to go uh, have prayer time. Um, so it's important that we you know, make those accommodations and that we not shut out a specific group of people um, just because, you know, they need to take an extra five, 10 minutes to, to go pray. I mean, these people are bringing a huge, huge benefit to our company. Um, and not, I'm not just meaning that in the, the labor aspect, but the difference of opinions and difference of experiences that they're bringing uh, to our company is invaluable. Um, since then, you know, Again, like uh, like Allison said earlier, these individuals we've been able to promote them. We've been able to build them into leadership positions, and integrate them into our upper leadership um, within the company. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dana. You know, I, I think I, I, I to the point that both of you make, I, I can I can say that. Um, seeing the person, right? Uh, you, you're not just getting an employee, you're getting a language barrier, you're getting a culture, you're getting customs. Uh, they now mentioned the funeral, how important funerals are for this community. So uh, acknowledging these customs goes goes beyond just the person. Uh, one, one of the examples I can, I can tell you is uh, using myself as an example with my children as a second generation. Um, it is very important for me that my customs and my culture is acknowledged knowledge because that help, helps me with uh, as a parent portray the, the, the portray them to my children you know sustain the culture sustain the custom uh, otherwise I'm alone I'm lost and then my children we will be, will come accustomed to what's around them and and therefore my customs and my culture was lost and then there is that gap there's that uh, disconnect between community and employer. But if the employer is investing time and dedicating to learning about me, allowing my customs, uh, maybe having one day uh, bring food, you know, and, and, and celebrate my culture that that is supporting me at the same time, supporting my family, supporting my language. And then, and then we're growing together again, you know, we're going back to the growth. So yeah, absolutely very important to recognize the person, not only as an employee, but also uh, as as what they bring, uh, uh, and I think Jackie said it is not just learning the uh, them to learn the English, but ourselves also learning the the, the language. So thank thank you.
you. Thank you both for that. Yes, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to the next question. So question four, we have refugees face many immediate challenges when they enter the US. Some of the biggest challenges for refugees when they start working is coordinating transportation and childcare. Uh, was, this, was this a difficulty you faced when, you, um, when employing refugees? And if so, how were you able to assist your employees during this transition? And I think we have Allison to answer this one. So I think the biggest, what, what I've learned just throughout the years, um, flexibility, um, especially we have a team of only women and childcare is just huge. And there's so many things that come up with, um, you know, with doctor's appointments, or maybe they couldn't find somebody who could take care of their children during a certain time period. So we're fortunate enough where we, again, we are wholesale manufacturing. We are not retail. We are not technically you know, open to the public. So at the beginning, I think going, you know, nine to five, we're going to be here. We're going to be nine to five, um, kind of micromanaging um, everything from the beginning to having more of uh, trust, more of a flexible schedule where we have, we have busy times, we have times that are slow and um, pretty much saying, hey, this is what we have to do. When can you come in? Um, so uh, most of the team, they like to come in very early in the morning. They like to be out in the afternoon when they have to go pick up the kids. So, so yes, um, it's gotten to the degree where, um, again, with Pa, who's, who's Mama Bear, who's really, the, the, she is, she's just so amazing. Um, that she really runs it. She runs the crew. She knows what we have to get done when we need to do it. But again, that, that flexibility is just, it's, it's so huge. Um, especially, uh, you know, for women. Um, so yes, that's one thing that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I really appreciate that response. I think flexibility is also, um, becoming a more of a competitive thing that employers are offering in general to any employee. Um, but it's so, um, if you are, are able to offer this, um, I know that there are some shifts that are set shifts and there are some requirements that are just required for the job. Um, but if you can be flexible in other ways as much as possible, I think it makes a, a big difference for, for employees. So thank you yeah, for that response. Yeah, I think it's it's tough right now just with, with COVID and everything that happened and people transitioning to working at home. I mean, that's what employers are facing right now, where it's trusting them to do the job at home, you know, so it's that as an employer, just kind of, uh, you know, letting the reins loose a little bit and going, okay, let's see what you can do, but this, we have to get it done by, by this date. So right. It's, it's certain setting. deadlines, certain measures. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone else Aaron, have something they want to add? Oh yeah. Jess. Yes. This is, yes. And of course we, um, as a healthcare, acute care hospital, we're open 24 seven. And so there is not the opportunity in many cases to offer the flexibility. I mean, there's some, but especially during COVID when we experienced, you know, high patient census and staffing challenges at the same time. And of course we might be a little different. We do have a daycare, it's not on site, but it is across the street from our main campus on Sixth Avenue, but the accommodation that we made was to allow, um, because we, because our child care center is only open to a certain age of youngsters. And so the accommodation that we made was that school age children during the period of times when they were not able to attend school, if you recall during the early fall months of 2020, when most schools were wrestling with how they would operate, we did allow siblings to attend at a very minimal um, cost uh, to attend our or to um, attend our childcare facility. So we saw that that was, you know, something that and being flexible to help our staff um, through that period of time was needed. And I want to point out transportation. Uh, which you listed in your question too, is often an issue because especially if you're worried about, you know, your school-aged children and um, being able to pick them up 
if they're ill, um, that, you know, that comes into play too. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate that response because yeah, there's, there's some realities that you can't be flexible in every way all the time. There are some, some realities that are just there. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, trying to be creative in this way for parents. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. The, um, transportation is a huge barrier for childcare too. It goes hand in hand. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. You know, I can, I, I cannot agree more. These are two challenges that are real, that are difficult to address. Uh, you know, and so, and sometimes it could just be, uh, uh, "Quote unquote simple solution." You know, sometimes as humans, we're trying to find the 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 answer outside or elsewhere. But sometimes looking inside too. You know, maybe uh, asking our current employees. You know, who of you know of a daycare? Who of you will be interested on in providing daycare on second shift or on first shift? If you work second shift, can you provide daycare first shift, etc. You know, so so sometimes organizing your crew and and find the answer within. Also, you know, do you live in or Urbandale, I have 10 people that live in Urbandale. Could you provide transportation? You know, and then finding a way to incentivize that employee or, or finding a way to or have them organize within themselves how much will they con will they pay this driver to drive them to work, etc. You know, so sometimes the answer is it's inside organizing the, the crews, uh, thinking uh, outside the box. But uh, I think I said it uh, many times, it's, it's, it's going to take the whole village to help the village become a better village. It's not just management, it's not just the lead, it's not just the governor, it's not just the person standing in the corner. It's gonna take everybody's effort to make this effort a success. So thank you all. All right, we have question number five. This is the last question. Uh, great questions, uh, great answers. I can see that there's many questions coming through the chat that are also great. Uh, this question is for Dana and Jackie. Did you provide training for immediate supervisors who would be overseeing onboarding refugee employees? What training was provided and what was it successful? Dana, you wanna start? I think you may be mute again. Yes, I've, I'll definitely answer that. Um, we don't have one day of training or one week of training. It's more an everyday thing. It's addressed every single day when we meet and, and do planning and things like that. Um, very much um, value bilingual employees. We do seek them out. We seek out people from populations that are represented in our town. And we get a lot of learning back from them, just input of what they are hearing from their community within a community. If there's a problem that a group is facing, we definitely want to hear about that. So, so they're very valuable to us. Um, you know, as far as training, we have several people here who are trying to learn different languages or at least a little bit of it. Not necessarily that they can, you know, be fluent in that language, but if you can just say a few words, uh, greet somebody, ask how they're doing. They definitely appreciate that, I think, and get the idea that the you other know, city is interested in them. Um, another thing that's been valuable for us is community meetings. Uh, a couple of days into the Ukraine invasion, we were already having a meeting about anticipating that people might be coming here, what their specific needs would be, and how we can prepare for them and, and meet those needs for them. Uh, you know, from simple things as to what foods that they would want to eat, as to what jobs that they would want to do. All those kind of things. We did the same thing when uh, Afghanistan was starting to happen and we were seeing people start to come to Iowa from there. So it's important to have those meetings before that starts and to know what your plan is so you can help those people get assimilated in. Uh, working closely with churches, that helps us get some information, some training that way. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a Buddhist temple in town and a lot of different religions. So we're able to gather and work with those people. And that's an education process unto itself. Um, we also work through community services officers, we call it, that's in our police department. The two largest immigrant populations, we have a person representing them in our police department who go out and, and deal with the public every single day and they're not arresting people, they're helping people. So they're able to gather a lot of information and share with us. So that works really well. Um, Otherwise, we translate materials into three different languages at least. So we're making sure that we're able to communicate with as many people as we can. 
and uh, working with a, a health coalition in our community that uh, does some of the things that we can't do. So they help educate us as well and educate the entire community. It's nice to have that one hub that you can go to when you have an issue so you can learn how to communicate and, and get information where it needs to go. A translator bureau in Storm Lake is also an important thing for us. Um, people are able to get certified, get trained. That helps them. It's great to have on your resume that you are a translator. You can make a living doing it if you like, or you can do it as a volunteer. So um, I would encourage any community to look into that if they haven't. And kind of that's where we're at on that. Wonderful. Thank well, you. I would echo, um, I applaud the um, efforts that Storm Lake is making for their community. It seems to me it's a win-win both for residents as well as your businesses and um, other organizations to, you know, to work collaboratively. And so similarly, um, I would say that our goal at in Mercy at Mercy One is um, Dana's point about uh, it's an everyday thing. And that's what cultural humility means to us. It's self-reflection and it's understanding where you are in terms of, are you able really to be sensitive to the cultural differences of not just your colleagues, but also our patients. And we stress that, or we introduce the cultural humility philosophy from the time that the individual is recruited. We let them know that as an organization, we are mission driven by this goal to help the most vulnerable among us achieve the best health experience. So if you're on board with this mission, we welcome you with open arms. If you're not, maybe we're not the employer for you. And so once that they join it, once when uh, a, an employer or colleague joins us from day one in orientation, um, we then, you know, um, start the cultural humility specific training, understanding implicit bias, unconscious bias is definitely part of our training. Our parent organization, Trinity Health, um, has a very robust series that they too ask leaders specifically to take, which includes um, racism as a public health issue and cultural proficiency. So these are required courses for our leaders here at Mercy One. And then I'd like to give you a specific example of a manager that I elevate as many times as I can. And, and Stephanie Morris may have met her. Um, but this individual oversees our food and nutrition uh, services. And she has one of the most diverse staff in our in, at Mercy One. Um, I believe we calculated this the other day. She has staff that speak about eight different languages. And um, a few months ago, um, an individual from another department was hoping to find employment for a family member. I believe it was even his father who spoke no English whatsoever. And, you know, it had been really kind of frustrated with, you know, the response that this individual was getting from other employers in the community and told our manager, you know, I know that I'm not supposed to appeal directly to you as a manager, but, you know, we're kind of at wit's end with trying to find something for my father. And so this manager said, absolutely, you know, you are a valued employee here at Mercy One. And um, I actually happen to have um, an entry level opening if your father is interested. So they brought him in and all of the things that you previously heard, we had you know, the other employee who was bilingual help his father fill out the application. Uh, and then our manager hired him, but they went one step further and to really make him feel um, that he wasn't, um, to separate him out because of his language skills. They actually started putting up cards for him every day um, to let him know, you know, what this means in your language, like hot and cold, um, what the supplies were, 
uh, and and so she would take time to make sure that every day he had a list of his tasks in his language and was able to understand you know um, what he was um, actually going to be doing for the day so not only did she do that every day but we have what are called huddles and huddles are where all of our units and departments meet first thing in the morning or at the beginning of every shift and talk about, you know, here's what happened at the previous shift. And for this gentleman, she made sure that there was always somebody available um, because the son of course had his own job and couldn't on the spot come and interpret for uh, this, um, for this person. And she made sure that there was somebody always available to interpret what he needed um, from the huddle. And so she shared with me last week, he's been with them, I think I said six months, it might, yeah, about six months. And of course, started with us speaking no English. Um, his first language is Spanish. And um, so she, as she was walking out for the day, um, I believe she said um, buenas tardes uh, to him because, you know, of course she is um, wanting to make sure that he understood her. And he turned around and said, have a nice day, Doreen. And they had no idea that he was learning, you know, this English on his own. But I shared with her, because you took the time to value and respect him, where he started his journey, he then reciprocated because this was very important to him, the respect that he was treated. And so that's one manager I could, you know, probably give you some other examples. But like Dana said, it's an everyday um, learning experience for our staff, in addition, of course, to the formal training I mentioned. And it's something that we stress even during our recruitment process that this is who we are. Wonderful answers, absolutely. Is is again going back to seeing the person, value uh, them from who they are, what they bring, uh, their their needs. So very good questions. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, and this is this is probably end. where I'm gonna say, hey, we're gonna stay on a little bit later, um, but not necessarily close the 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 meeting. But I know some people probably have to. Uh, leave earlier than we do. So um, I want to thank Jackie, Allison, Alex, and Dana for, for answering some of our questions. And I know this is going to be a pretty popular topic going forward for those who weren't able to attend today. Um, so those that want to stay on and um, listen to some of the answers that were uh, listen to the answers of questions that were in the chat, please do so. Um, if you wanted uh, the recording last week's session, I just posted that in the chat. So otherwise, um, Nicole, do you want to moderate the questions that came in? Yeah, I sure will. So I just want to say first, Bill, I saw your message in there. So if you do stay on, um, could you um, talk a little bit once we get through the questions about your ride? Um, service and kind of what you talked about last week, just kind of give a recap. Um, are you able to stay on a few more minutes extra? You bet. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Thank you, sir. So we're going to start with Laura. And Laura asked, um, she mentioned that she is a small nonprofit um, and is asking if anyone has grant opportunities that would assist with paying with a translator or language classes. So before I hand this one off, I'm just going to say that at um, Iowa Works, we do have Rosetta Stone um, that's available to anyone. So they would just need to um, contact us and we can get them set up with that. And also for or some ELL classes, some of our partners do have those. Um, so we can, um, if, you know, we're not gonna host an ELL class, but we can certainly help you get connected with those if that's what you're looking for, or Rosetta Stone. Does anyone else have any um, um, solutions for that question? Hey, Nicole, this is Stephanie Morris with the Refugee Alliance. I wanted to add in, you know, we help organize the Refugee Day on the Hill every February-ish, every year. 
Um, and one of the things that we have really tried to, to advocate for is an, an increase. There's two different funding streams for ELL classes in the state. There's K through 12, that obviously comes from the Department of Education, and there's community-based uh, English classes as well. So we have always, for the past, since I can remember, have always advocated for an increase at least, or at least, you know, stay the same for um, funding for that community-based ELL system. But there are organizations in Iowa that have been helping to facilitate those community-based ELL classes as well. And I would be um, more than happy to touch base with people after the webinar today to provide more information or, or help connect resources and places even outside of central Iowa for those community-based ELL classes. Stephanie, I also posted the link to the work groups from the Rossi website if you wanna kind of cover that. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone's not familiar, Rossi is we're a collaborative of all of the different stakeholders in central Iowa that want to see our community being welcoming to refugees and immigrants. So we again, the day on the hill I mentioned, we help organize, we help organize the World Refugee Day uh, here for the state, which this webinar series is part of. And we also host a summit every fall as well that offers information to employers, health providers, mental health providers, educators, police departments. I mean, just anyone wanting to learn how to, to work with and serve refugee communities better. Um, additionally, we also have these work groups and I'll keep this as brief as possible, but we have work groups that focus on education, um, economic mobility, which really wraps employment and housing and, and financial education, community justice, health and mental health, transportation, interpretation, translation, advocacy, and then others as well. So I'm happy to, again, touch base with people that have more questions or are wanting to see about connecting to, to similar, um, similar efforts in their particular regions of the state. Um, and then there's a resource directory on there as well, which I can touch on later um, or after after the webinar as well. So that has, it's, for, it's refugee specific, but it also has a list of all of the ethnic community-based nonprofits that we work with. And there are around, I think over 30 now. Um, when I started in 2018, there was about seven. So that's been a, that's been a, a, a huge, um, you know, privilege and honor to, to see um, kind of take off there as well. So yeah, the, the website's there. And again, if anyone has questions after the fact, just let me know. All right, thank you so much. So um, the next question is about accommodations. And I know, um, Alex, you kind of touched on this one, but um, what accommodations do you make for the religious beliefs? Um, and she listed included, but not limiting to prayer during the workday, recognizing other religious holidays um, and potential needs for time off, specific, clothing items, um, et cetera. So I'm not sure who would like to take that one, but would anyone like to kind of answer on what they have done or seen or um, how you can kind of guide someone looking for those answers? We'll kind of, um, you know, go off what, what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, I think when you bring in a new refugee group, again, I think your first step really needs to be to understand that refugee group and understand what their needs are and what the cultural differences are and learn how we can embrace that and how we can be flexible and make accommodations. So, um, you know, I gave some examples earlier of uh, how we've done that within our plant and within other plants. Um, but as far as, you know, uh, days off, um, one example I can give is the Nepali population that we have here. Um, their religious belief, um, they, they observe Diwali, uh, typically in October. And so uh, we, we, we experienced this the first time uh, last year when we, you know, started bringing uh, more of the Nepali population in. And all of a sudden we realized it's, uh, you know, beginning of October and half of our, uh, our second shift needs to uh, take uh, several days off so that they can observe uh, Diwali. Um, and I think it's important that we, um, again, are being uh, understanding and flexible. And so what we did is we made an adjustment to our production schedule 
so that we are able to accommodate for those individuals to, to travel uh, to their family um, and observe their uh, religious holidays. So. Fantastic, thank you. Did anyone else have anything to add to that question? I actually wanted to add another example um, based off the days off, just like Alex was talking about. Some, some employers have updated their policy. A lot of holidays in the US that you automatically get off are like um, Christmas Eve, Christmas, um, Easter, and um, that's not celebrated in other cultures. And so some of the policy updates that employers have spoken about is um, changing it to having floating like religious holidays. So then you can choose when in the year that affects you. Um, so it doesn't have to be Easter. It doesn't have to be Christmas, but it could be so just another option. Yep. And that's exactly, you know, I hesitate because we're a much larger employer, but that's exactly uh, what we do. We have, you're allocated a certain number of days in addition to your regular vacation time for holidays. And it, we, it doesn't matter which one. You know, you can, for example, prior to Martin Luther King Day being a holiday, I did not, I haven't been here that long, but I heard from some of my colleagues that they used the floating holiday to take that day off. All right, thank you for um, adding those comments in there. Um, so Jake then was asking how the accommodations have affected the morale amongst um, current employees. Uh, anyone want to take an answer to that one, either positively or I'm sure there might be um, some negative effects. So if you want to just kind of answer how those are done. Nicole, I just wanted a little clarification current employees or non-refugee employees because some of our refugee think, employees have been here quite some time with us but um so jake i'm not sure if you're still here if you wanted to um give a little bit deeper explanation what i'm taking from this might be you know if you are giving um a, a population maybe time off for something um does that affect the morale of you know the non-foreign born gotcha. um population right okay yep so um, he says employees that are not part of a population that is receiving a specific accommodation so um and so here's here that that is a very good question and um <laughs> actually where it came up for our colleagues here at Mercy One is we offered an up we offered an opportunity about seven to eight years ago. Um, it was called first generation scholarship to Mercy College, which we're blessed, you know, to have an academic um, affiliation with us where we could offer assistance to our employees to upgrade their skills, education and training. So we offered a scholarship opportunity called First Generation uh, in Healthcare. And our goal at that time was to increase the pipeline of obviously diverse um, individuals in the pipeline. And first generation, of course, means, you know, um, not having, um, uh, you know, not being, or foreign born, I think is the word you all use. So um, we had a challenge from employees who were not um, eligible or even their um, children, it was because it was for their children. And uh, so we had a challenge from, you know, employees who were not eligible for that opportunity. Yet we pointed out that, that we have many other scholarship opportunities in addition, you know, to this first generation. All of our employees are eligible to apply for um, what we call Mercy One tuition uh, grants or assistance. Um, there's various other scholarship opportunities. So I do, I do understand that question. And um, as it was related in that case, you know, about is there um, kind of an unfair um, 
uh, arrangement here for this first generation scholarship, we quickly pointed out that we certainly have opportunities for all of our employees. And um, this, this one had a particular goal of increasing the diverse pipeline in healthcare. It, so Jake, does that kind of answer? I think the days off was answered with having the floating holidays, if you're able to do that and allow staff to choose which holidays they want to take. Yeah, he said thank you. So Ida, okay. does anyone else want to um, answer or add any more to that? All right, so I don't have any more questions in the chat. So if anyone does have any more, go ahead and put them in. Um, so I'm going to let Bill um, just kind of speak to what he was talking to in the chat um, for a moment to kind of address the, the ride um, and transportation uh, comments that were brought up. Sure, yeah. So um, I'm Bill Rain. I've been a recruiter in Des Moines for 29 years, um, about nine months ago, 10 months ago, um, um, uh, started to uh, transport um, uh, uh, folks uh, from uh, the fort uh, to one of my clients. Um, that worked well. So then I started to transport uh, homeless uh, folks um, to a job um, that worked really well. Um, and, um, and I've expanded it out. I now have six vans, soon to be seven. Um, we're transporting about 55 refugees right now, but that number is going up um, next week. Uh, and so we'll be pretty close to 75 um, um, daily transportation of refugees. Um, Job Rides is the name of the 501c3. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so uh, we're, we're, we're rookies um, at all this um, uh, and uh, kind of making it up as we go, but, but it's been a really neat experience so far. Um, we charge a client $50 a week per rider. And with a lot of riders, especially the refugees, they've been, they'll have their 90 days where they're getting a free ride, if you will. And so what employers that we're working with are doing now is the, the, the employer will pay $25. The refugee will pay $25. And, um, and then we are looking for both private and public funds to make up for the rest of it. Um, and, it, 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 and so it's been working pretty, pretty slick. Um, uh, today I have to drive. I drive, uh, uh, I wasn't driving for a little while and now all of a sudden I got uh, one driver out on jury duty, another one uh, getting his hip done and uh, another one that couldn't drive. So I. I was, uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm in this, um, the van becomes its own little entity um, where uh, English is being learned um, uh, 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 and, uh, and, and a variety pack of, of experiences are being, uh, are being done. Um, and so it's been, um, it's been such a neat run and ride uh, with the refugees. Um, uh, one message, you know, a lot of, a lot of different things that we're learning. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, one of the main things to keep in mind uh, is that refugees are just people. I mean, they're just, they, you got grumpy ones, you got happy ones, you got, uh, you got ones that, uh, love to go to work and ones that kind of drag themselves out of bed and to go to work. And so that's been neat. One of my drivers took, um, uh, he has uh, four refugees, one of which speaks pretty good English. And he found out they'd never been on a boat before. So he offered to take them out on his boat. He's got a pontoon boat. Uh, 40 people showed up uh, for, for a picnic um, 
And, uh, and so he was taking refugees on their first boat ride, um, uh, women, children, and, uh, and, and the husbands, um, they're separated, you know, during the picnic and all this stuff. And he said it was just one of the neatest experiences he's ever had. He's just, he's totally into it. Um, and, uh, uh, um, but, but what we've been able to do um, in a fairly short amount of time, besides the practicality of just getting people to work, is I, I've really seen and experienced where people are kind of getting, I don't know, Americanized, if you will, a little quickly. <laughs> um, um, uh, one guy I have to, I asked to be dropped off at the DART station. Um, and I finally asked him, why do you have to go to the DART station? Well, he has to learn English and he's got to go to class at DMACC. Well, I thought he was going to Ankeny class. And uh, I said, well, maybe I can take you up to a Oh no, class over here. Oh, well, I can take you to that DMAC. That's no problem. As a matter of fact, that's on the way, you know? And, and so we take him to DMAC and, and, uh, and it's just been, I don't know. It's getting to be a little bit of a, 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 a neat deal uh, for people. Uh, we're looking to expand this out. Um, not that we're gonna solve every problem, but transportation um, to and from work on a daily basis, once those 90 days are up, companies tend to lose um, half of their staff <laughs> because people can't get to work and they kind of start separating and they kind of go where they can get to work or they'll leave the city and you got to start over. Uh, what we're trying to do is keep people here keep people from having to start over and just be really, really nice um, uh, to everybody. We're gonna start taking people to picnics in a mosque, um, looking for volunteers for Sunday riders. Um, um, I learned that there, we have 10 mosques in town and, um, and so uh, we're gonna get some of that stuff figured out as well. So it's been a neat experience. Um, we're getting a little maxed out until either the state or, or we get some uh, private or public funds, but um, uh, with about 125, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's where we're at. So, so anyway, I'm sorry, I digress, uh, but uh, that's what we have going. It's been a really neat experience and uh, we're doing it 24 hours. We're doing all three shifts for one of our manufacturers. So, uh, so it's been a, uh, it's been a neat run so far. All right, thank you so much. So that is all the questions that I had in the chat. So um, we'll just kind of wrap it up here. I will invite anyone, um, if you have more questions or wanna chat, um, you're welcome to stay on. We'll keep it open a little bit, but we will be back next week for our third and final um, webinar. So that's going to be on long-term success. So kind of taking all the things that we've discussed and learned and seeing how you can um, keep that in a plan uh, for some long-term success. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Allison. Thank you, everybody.